Ice is not a classical element. It was often called to be a derivative of water or a variant of the solid earth. But there is no denying that the cult is rife with inspirations that cover a wide variety of takes that are well displayed in modern day media. Ice could be slow or slippery. It could be soft or sharp. In creature collectors, such inspirations have affected locations, abilities, and most notably, character designs. And I'm placing an emphasis on creature collectors as I'm working on one myself. Before I show off another line of Stemma designs in this video, we'll go over the ice type both thematically and mechanically. Because for the current titan of the genre Pokemon, the ice type is difficult. Unlike the previous monster collectors who categorized their bestiaries to families of species, Pokemon would use elemental types to describe each one of them, a practice that harkens to other role-playing games where certain enemy encounters fall under an element, which each has certain weaknesses and resistances. The first Pokemon games included the Ice type, but like several of the types in the game, none of the monsters were only that type, as if Ice was merely a descriptor of the environment they lived in. 3 out of 5 ice types here were water and ice typed. It wouldn't be until the 3rd generation until Pokemon would finally get their first pure ice type. But despite being around since the first generation, the ice type is now the rarest type of the franchise. For a theme that has such a wide range of interpretations, it's surprising that there are fewer ice types than the initial elusive dragon type or even the fairy type which was added only 6 generations into the series. Now is the ice type just hard to make designs for? Although there are fewer living species in colder climates, where that fauna tries their best to keep warm instead of spewing frost breath, even fewer real-life animals breathe fire, yet there's no problem in taking creative liberties to make more fire types. The theme is most likely not at fault. Now before I mention the most infamous part about Pokemon's ice type, I must say that this particular phenomenon of having a dearth of ice types is most likely due to how cold biomes are placed later in the story. Thus, only a few ice types in this area can be introduced before the player finalizes their team to face the Elite Four. Comparatively, Koromon, another creature collector, had already established their ice type in their starter trio. Thus, there was a lot more narrowed space to add more ice Koromons to the game. But there's another major problem that arises from Pokemon's insistence on ice types being a late game encounter. These new ice types need to be worthwhile. Not every Pokemon needs to be competitively viable, but players would already be hesitant to make a substitution this late into the game. Whether it be their design or their capabilities, if these late Pokemon don't have a compelling reason, the player wouldn't change their team. And while a few can get away with their designs alone, like Snob, not everyone can be like Snob, or else the game would become too difficult to proceed. And again, not every Pokemon has to be good in the game. Heck, every Pokemon doesn't need to be popular either. But Game Freak has clearly put in extra effort into ice types of recent generations, as many of them have optimized stats and or very strong abilities. See, beneath this whole discussion, there's an underlying issue with Pokemon's ice type and the cracks are becoming too large to ignore. Pokemon's ice type is infamously frail. Ice has often been paired as the opposite to fire, but it's an unfair rivalry. In almost every matchup, ice is weak to the fire element. From Final Fantasy IV to 2023's Moonstone Island, this type matchup stands. In fact, this is how the aforementioned Koromon formed their type trio. But Pokemon's ice type has 4 weaknesses. Most types in the game have 2 or 3, so honestly, this isn't that big of a number, especially considering how some types have even more. No, the issue isn't with the weaknesses, but is rather with their resistances. Their single resistance. Ice only resists themselves, and that cannot cover for the weaknesses another type might bring in when a Pokemon is dual typed. This is why Ice Pokemon appear to be weak, as many combinations also yield double weaknesses. Instead, Pokemon's Ice type was designed to be offensive, sniping competitively popular types like Flying and Dragon. However, this only gives value to Ice type attacks, which many Pokemon of other types have access to. Sure, Ice type Pokemon would get the same type attack bonus, but most times the extra damage from the type matchup is enough. This makes it easier to make glass cannons out of the ice type rather than making characters for the tank role, which unfortunately describes many ice tropes. 
The ice element is known to slow things down. Our kinetic theory, where movement is relative to temperature. And why we've recently seen strong ice type glass cannons? Not everyone can be a speed skater. And Pokemon does have their fair share of slow tanky ice types. In fact, on average, they apparently have some of the tankiest builds in the game. But that's because they really need those defensive points. And even then, they can't operate defensively if they're paired with the wrong type. Take Avaluk for example, a mono ice type from the 6th generation who has a massive defense but minimal points on the special end. When Pokemon made a variant of this guy in Legends Arceus, they decided to make them ice and rock. Now this might make sense thematically as they're now a terrestrial glacier in this game that takes place in the past. In fact, to further sweeten the deal, the Pokemon has concentrated even more of their points into their physical stats and even some more speed. Wow, that's a lot of weaknesses. And it especially hurts considering how competitively popular a lot of these types are. While not everyone needs to be competitively viable, it's hard to call a design defensive if they fail to be defensive in the game. Heck, when I was looking at various videos about the current meta, it's crazy how ice types are considered to be buffed in this generation because the game allows you to turn it into another type. And that's the thing. These Pokemon are designed to be really good with monstrous stats and strong abilities just because the ice type is that heavy of a nerf. Which is weird because looking at other games, Ice is often treated as an equal to the classics like fire and water. In Yokai Wash, there's a chain of rock, paper, scissor like interactions where ice falls between wind and fire. In this game, with every type that's affected to another, not only do they deal more damage to that type, but they also resist it, meaning that ice is super effective to wind and resist wind. Where the former might be that kinetic theory again, slowing down the particles in the air. Or it could be how flying species also migrate to avoid the winter. I'm personally having a harder time to think about how ice could resist the wind, but if you have any creative takes, feel free to leave that in the comments below. Otherwise, I recognize how it's too uphold symmetry between this game's type interactions. Now, Moonstone Island also has this loop of type matchups where ice sits between poison and fire. Maybe due to how the cold has a preservation aspect with how microbes can become inert when frozen. From the looks of it, and to be thorough, every spirit in this game also has another weakness depending on how they are cultivated. And there doesn't seem to be any resistances all across the board, which is another way to balance the types. The point of these examples is that ice can and has been treated like any other type. And while having asymmetrical matchups are an opportunity to add general flavors to a type, like steel being defensive and fighting being offensive, ice as an element offers a wide range of inspirations. So having the type operate so narrowly in the game really harms the other aspects of the type. Nevertheless, Pokemon has continued to try other ways to make ice types more worthwhile. Other than min-maxing stat spreads and giving strong abilities, the dynamics of a Pokemon battle can be changed with certain moves. We talked about how attacks don't really help Ice-type Pokemon, but what about status moves that specifically deal with Ice-types? Hail was first introduced in Generation 3, where it dealt damage to everyone on the field except for Ice-types. The next gen had abilities associated with said weather, but there was no specific buff across the board, just a lack of a penalty. This chip damage hampered everyone without the ice type or certain abilities, making it hard to build competitive teams around a mechanic, a problem that the other weathers wouldn't have. In Pokemon Sun and Moon, the new move Aurora Veil was unveiled, a screen that would reduce all incoming damage by 50% for a few turns. This is the defensive buff that ice Pokemon needed, as well as helping other members of your team as long as the screen is up. Additionally, this move is nearly exclusive to Ice-type Pokemon. However, there was a major catch. This screen can only be set up during Hail. Setting up weather has proven to be quite a hassle in the game, unless the Pokemon's ability triggers it upon entry. That is why Sun and Moon's Alolan Ninetales was able to find so much usage despite having a double weakness to steal as their snow warning and faster speed allowed them to set up Aurora Veil vale in one turn. Two generations later with Scarlet and Violet, Hail was changed into Snow, which doesn't hurt anyone anymore, but they boost the physical defense of Ice-type Pokemon. This was a clear attempt to make up for the poor defensive type matchups Ice Type has. With Aurora Veil vale working in the snow as well, Alola Ninetales was able to find a niche in the current format, which disallows legendaries. However, 
A9Tail's success over the other snow setting Pokemon is largely attributed to their speed, which means that there's still some ways to go to make Tenkei Ice types viable. Speed has proven to be quite important in the simultaneously determined turn based games, which is probably why Snow and Coromon buffs all Ice type Coromon speeds instead. Alright, I'm mentioning Coromon again because I wanted to transition into another ice theme mechanic, as the Snow and Coromon also has the chance to freeze any non ice types during the campaign. Freeze is a common status condition across media as a whole often drawing parallels to the petrified condition in older mythology. In a video game setting, freeze can be devastating, as they have to stand there defenselessly as their opponent wallops on them. In Karaman, freezes last only one turn, but your defenses are lower during that turn, which introduces a choice for your opponent to either take the chance to attack you or try setting up during that turn instead. For Pokemon, the freeze condition is much less forgiving. Maybe it was a way to emphasize Ice's offensive capabilities, but Freeze has been the most brutal condition in the game. Of the non-volatile status conditions, Sleep, Paralysis, and Freeze can prevent the opponent from moving. Sleep does so for a maximum of 3 turns, and Paralysis has a 25% chance to prevent moves. Both are devastating conditions that are often used in competitive. Freeze, on the other hand, always prevents that Pokemon from moving until they thaw, and they only have a 20% chance to do so every turn. That Pokemon is forced to be a sitting duck, waiting on luck as they're potentially locked out for the rest of the battle. All the while, their opponent can safely set up on them. And this 20% chance to thaw used to be only 10%. Actually in Gen 1, there was no chance to thaw yourself naturally. Over the years, there have been certain moves that can thaw a frozen Pokemon by hitting it or by the frozen Pokemon using it. But not all competitive sets would be able to reliably thaw out of this condition. Naturally, ice types could never freeze, which was a passive to the type I suppose. But despite their effect, freeze is quite rare in the competitive scene, because unlike the other conditions, there's no move that reliably applies freeze. It's just that a few attacks have a chance to freeze, usually around a 10% chance. Thus, this ice type's passive rarely comes into play. If only the effect wasn't so punishing, we might be able to see it used more, which is what Pokemon tried to do in Legends Arceus where Freeze was replaced with Frostbite, which operated like a special attack version of Burn, applying damage over time. Interestingly, Pokemon didn't bring Frostbite over to the next main game, but who knows if they'll ever revisit the concept ever again. Now, Freeze can probably be balanced without completely ditching the idea, like we've seen with Karaman's single turn of Freeze. In Temtem, there is no Ice type. However, a few water and a few neutral techniques can apply cold or freeze conditions, where cold itself doesn't do anything, but attaining the cold status condition again freezes the Temtem, which also prevents them from attacking for a certain number of turns. This cold condition appears to directly counter their burn as well, which is a fun dynamic to potentially cure one for another. Temtem has no ice type, but they were able to include the theme through the water element which is a common interpretation as well. Ice is often connected to water. In Cassette Beast, there's a unique type matchup system, where on top of effectiveness, they have special effects that apply in certain interactions. These interactions seem to be easier to intuit during gameplay, as Cassette Beasts are normally single type until they fuse. But for Ice Cassette Beasts, getting hit with a fire move would turn them into water, and hitting a water beast with ice would turn them into an ice type. Now at the end of the day, ice is the term we specifically use for frozen water. And a lot of games utilize this connection to have a special interaction between ice and water, or to circumvent using ice as an element as a whole. But we use this ice term to usually describe the cold, like with dry ice, which is frozen CO2, not water at all. There's no denying that the cold is rife with inspirations. Thus, in Stemma, I'll be continuing my cryotype. If you haven't seen my other videos, Stemma is my collection of STEM-based creatures that I've been designing over the years, and lately I've been making videos about making a game with these guys. While I'm still toiling away at the menu UI, I've been mulling over my world building whenever I get the chance to. Plan for my cryotype to have some resistances, but otherwise, the type isn't geared towards a certain build, unlike my Toxa and Forta types. 
I'm not showing off my type chart because last time I did so, I ended up removing that type entirely. Just saying that the matchups are due to change, especially when I get this to a playtesting state. I've had plans for a cryo weather and a hazard, but the latter would require too much explaining about the main combat of my game. So I'll instead close this video out by sharing another stem line of mine. So this demo line actually pairs quite well with my last video's line, which was on permafrost, as this line is about this crazy phenomenon. So when lakes have a tree branch or some organic matter decaying in it, the microbes eating the matter usually expel methane gas. Methane is a very simple gas, as it's just one carbon connected to a bunch of hydrogens. You won't get a simpler hydrocarbon than this. When the lake freezes from the top down, these methane gases would become trapped into these beautiful bubbles. However, like last time, if climate change causes these lakes to thaw, the methane would be released. And methane is a greenhouse gas, which means it will fly up and trap even more heat in our atmosphere, causing even more climate change and even harsher weather conditions. That's why some scientists have gone around to burn these bubbles before they get released. So. My first stage was supposed to resemble a methane molecule with more rain, a little telescope goldfish-like kind of guy. I've been refraining from posting my attributes as I plan on changing them as I work on the game, but I've been thinking about this volatile attribute where exploding moves have priority. How much damage do these kind of moves do is all still up in the air. But more rain would advance into Mitranda, who resembles the flat frozen methane bubbles. The idea is that these guys produce methane, but they freeze it into bubbles while floating up to the surface so that the player needs to avoid stepping on them. But if you want to learn more about methane and this phenomena, I'll have links down in the description. I hope you liked this discussion on the cold type. By the way, you didn't get to draw a lineless art of these designs yet, so I'll do them over at my Twitch one day. I feel like owning a Waylord is probably a weapon. I actually have a lot of cryostema ideas that I haven't drawn yet, but I'll need to get my priorities straight. If you're interested in more videos like these or want to see more progress on my project, subscribe to the channel! I want to firstly thank my Patreon members for directly supporting me, as that's where I post weekly recordings of my game to the highest tier, but you can support me for free by just liking and sharing this video. So yeah, thank you for watching, and for the season, I wish you could find warmth where it matters.